Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, switching gears now uh, into more of like a, a more research type presentation, not a workshop. Um, thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited to be with you. Um, I'm very excited about you know this opportunity, and I'm very glad and um, happy that Bartos and the whole team put this together. Uh, I think it's really important, and I hope we continue to have such events. Uh, I think they're immensely helpful uh, for um, individuals in many different parts of the world. So thank you so much for doing this and, and thank you for inviting me to be part of it. Now, uh, Bart has wanted me to talk a little bit about the new task force white paper that just came out uh, in JCBS. And if you haven't seen it, you'll hear about it today and then feel free to, to um, go to the JCBS, it's, op it's an open uh, paper, so anybody can have access to it. Um, my area lately has been mostly, my research area has been utilizing digital technology into studying the different parameters of contextual behavior science that I, I study in my lab um, studies. So I decided to do a link between the two and uh, present uh, the task force um, recommendations while also talking a little bit how maybe we can apply this um, recommendations or um, start to point towards things that we can start doing using the digital medium. So um, let me start by um, presenting this. Uh, the World Health Organization uh, presents the top 10 diseases causing the most death worldwide are these. So cardiovascular, respiratory, cancer, different types of cancer. We have nervous disorders and here it includes some of uh, the mental health type issues we see, digestive, kidney, infections, accidents, diabetes, and musculoskeletal are the top ones. What is common in all these conditions? Interestingly, common to all these are maladaptive health-related behaviors, dysfunctional coping, and dysfunctional emotion regulation. And the major examples of maladaptive um, health-related and dysfunctional coping include uh, Okay, include smoking, alcohol and drug use, lack of physical activity, unhealthy eating, suppression of emotions, and lack of engagement in important life events. All health related behaviors, and despite important scientific advances, current pharmacological and surgical and psychosocial uh, treatments are hindered by these dysfunctional coping behaviors and clinicians' inability to help patients overcome them. Uh, I'm sorry, I was getting messages of people coming in. So I, I guess, Bartos, you're taking care of that, right? Uh, yes, I am. You can focus on the presentation. <laughs> okay. um, so why have we not yet been uh, successful? There are many reasons as to why we have not yet been successful, partly because problematic health behaviors are pathologized and classified in outdated systems, such as the DSM and the ICD. And there's ecological fallacy, which I'm gonna present in a minute what that is. But first let's consider the classification systems. So, what is the function of the DSM? You all must have heard of it. You all may have used it in, in your work. So the DSM-5, similar to its predecessors, continues to rely on a categorical approach to diagnosis and classification of mental disorders. With what aim? If the aim is to facilitate communication among practitioners, assist clinical assessment by providing clear symptom categories, aid research by providing distinct diagnostic groups against which to uh, compare clinical po populations and facilitate reimbursement for services, then 
maybe the DSM has, at least in part, been helpful and achieved this function. But if the function is to understand the reasons underlying psychological, psychopathological problems so as to guide treatments, then has this been achieved? And can it really be achieved with the biomedical reductionistic model on which the DSM has been based? So considering the reality of clinical practice, along with the extensive research findings that document that there is substantial symptom overlap among clinical disorders, high rates of comorbidity, heterogeneity, the most common diagnosis is the not otherwise specified category, unclear boundaries between categories, poor diagnosis reliability, and most importantly, an uncoupling of diagnosis from case conceptualization and treatment. So is it time to move beyond the DSM and find new ways um, a new approach that would help us get closer to truly serving the people who suffer and need our help. help. So recent changes in intervention science coupled with our inability to achieve health behavior change and alleviation in the common to humanity health problems have made this issue more central. NIMH, the National Institute of Mental Health in the United States, proposed this RDOC framework, which focus, with a focus on examining psychopathology in light of potential dysfunction, in particular neurobiological and behavioral systems, including affective valence systems, cognitive systems, social attachment processes, and arousal systems. So discovering basic dimensions of functioning across multiple units of analysis, cutting across DSM disorders. Not a bad approach, and we'll see some uh, relations to what we're proposing as well. Yet, um, one of the problems is that this approach provides great emphasis still on biological parameters. Can we really find one gene or one molecule or one cell for a specific health behavior problem. Personally, I'm a bit skeptical, but I guess we'll see in terms of time. Another recent development comes from Hoffman and Hayes who are extending Paul's 1969 question and ask what core biopsychosocial processes should be targeted with this client given this goal in this situation and how can they most efficiently and effectively be changed. These authors raise a different claim by their new conceptual developments of process-based therapy as a model of evidence-based treatment. In this new approach, assessment, procedures, and therapy can and should be linked by mechanisms of action implicated in the maintenance and treatment of suffering and the promotion of well being. Let's also look at the ecological fallacy I mentioned earlier. Um, ecological fallacy presents another problem that has hindered our ability to effectively help all who suffer and try to manage health-related behaviors. This occurs because we try to infer about the nature of individuals based on deductions and inferences from a group that those individuals possibly belong to. Most group or quantitative approaches utilize ways that in reality search for the average person. The average person with anxiety, with depression, the average smoker, and so on. To illustrate this problem, let's consider an example. In Cyprus, statistics show that an average family has 1.3 children. Can you think of a specific family that has 1.3 children? 
In a group design, the results of an intervention are averaged across participants and effects are evaluated by determining if there is a statistically significant difference between the groups. So large effects of an intervention on some participants, but only a small or no effect on others may result. So an intervention may have such an effect, but um, for some, but not others. We see um, a large within group variability. So when the intervention has differing effects on participants, we end up with a large within group uh, variability. So group designs may find no statistically significant effects when in fact the treatment may have practical or clinical significance. Alternatively, if the sample size is large enough, we may find a statistically significant effect for a treatment that has little practical significance. For example, consider a large intervention study for weight loss in severely obese people. The treatment group loses an average of about 500 grams and the control group shows no change in weight. If the sample size was large enough, the difference of 500 uh, grams would actually be statistically significant. But clearly, this has little practical or clinical significance. Would you join such an intervention to lose weight to, if you only knew that you would lose 500 grams on average? Yet, most of our psychological theories of change are within person yet they are mostly tested between people, nomothetically, and we try to apply them then ideographically to the individual or to the one person we may be working with. So different approaches are thus needed on multiple levels. So the contextual behavior, um, contextual behavior scientists have been on the forefront of proposing new strategies and tactics. Hot of the press is this white paper published by uh, an ACBS task force, the Association for Contextual Behavior Science, as you know. Um, this was a task force that was led by Stephen Hayes and it was created in 2018 and charged to come up with a progressive research strategy for contextual behavior research. Here you see um, a screenshot I took from one of the meetings um, that we had with the whole team. So through um, the adopted process, uh, we all agreed that the key features of CBS research and practice building our, on our functional and contextual bases and couched within an extended evolutionary model were these five. And we'll talk in a minute more about each one of these, along with the recommendations that the group came up with. In terms of the analytic approach of CBS, um, let me say that the focus on context in CBS is driven by pragmatic concerns as a, any analysis of behavior can only be practically useful in accomplishing prediction and influence as a unified goal if it specifies directly manipulable context to allow for experimental investigation and applied intervention. So CPS's experimental analysis of principle and processes need to be precise, cumulatively broad, encompassing a range of phenomena and coherent with data and principles drawn from related levels of analysis. So CPS proceeds from a publicly stated goal of seeking analysis that afford the prediction and influence of the behavior of whole organisms, interacting in and with, with a context that is considered historically and situationally with precision, scope, and depth. So the focus of CBS research is thus on development of principles and processes 
that are functionally defined and that apply across the full range of behavioral complexity. So here you see a summary of the different key fe features along with the recommendations that the group came up with. Lots of recommendations. I'm going to try not to bore you with all the details and, uh, and all this text and then give you examples from um, how digital technology can help uh, address or work through some of these recommendations. The first one, it's the multi-level um, domain or uh, key feature. And under this, we have um, that all life phenomena are nested in increasingly complex levels of organization from the self to from the cell to the organism to the family to the community to society at large this is not a new approach it's an evolutionary type of, of approach so adopting an evolutionary science framework um, and examining variables across levels makes uh, and, and also doing this cross-disciplinarily makes perfect sense. So we want to conduct um, basic experimental research into sources of behavior influence across all these different levels of analysis. And we want to define and examine what's called middle level terms. You may have heard this term before. So these are terms or variables situated between the basic analytic and then the more common language we may use in, in practice. And these multi-level contextual factors that influence these so-called middle level terms. So things like values or self-compassion or self as context would be considered middle level terms. So we wanna measure multi-level factors that cannot be manipulated. So if a factor cannot be directly manipulated, we want to make sure that we're accounting for that so that any changes can then be determined not to be due to this factor. We want to emphasize longitudinal measurement and identify and research scalable principles that can influence public health and solve global and societal problems at large. Technology is everywhere in our, in our lives. And I doubt um, that you may know anyone uh, these days who doesn't use any sort of digital means to either connect with others or to help them with various aspects of their lives. So we see technology nowadays is so prominent I usually, when I do uh, workshops or talks in person, I ask people, is there anyone here who doesn't own a cell phone or doesn't use technology? I can't really do this here because we're actually using technology to connect with each other right now. So um, the use of cell phones, for example, um, in a recent statistic I saw for 2021, 20, is in 3.8 billion across the globe. So we see that a large number of individuals all around the world are right now connected to cell phones. And here you see a little bit the breakup from different parts of the world as well. So even in like low income countries, we're seeing a rise in use of technology and actually technology can, can, can be used and harnessed um, among low-income middle countries as well. Have you seen this um, number, this ratio before? You may have seen this in any of, if you attended any of my colleagues and friends, Andrew Gloucester's presentations, this is a ratio I, I owe to him. But what this ratio tells us is um, that each week has 168 hours. And we usually spend one of these hours with our clients per week. And what do our clients do the rest of the 167 hours? 
I'm not sure if they're engaging a lot with the activities we would want them to be engaging with or the treatments that we want to be teaching them. Also, what do we usually do in our treatments, even in our research projects? We do a pre-treatment assessment and the person may look like my um, emoticon here, and then a post-treatment assessment, and people are happier, better quality of life, so on, depending on our outcomes. But what really happens in the middle? Do we really know? We may assume that we're doing a good job as therapists, and it's up to us that, you know, or we contributed to people feeling better at the end. But we may not really know what is happening in between. Of course, we cannot really follow our patients around 24 seven. So how can we access them and be present to serve them at even the non-traditional therapy times? Can we really reverse this ratio? And especially if our clients' lives are like this, or we expect behavior change to occur in such environments. When we were running our smoking cessation trials with adolescents in schools, they would tell us that they were able to not smoke during school hours or even after school most days. But come Saturday night, when they used to go out with their friends partying, and they even had a couple of drinks, not picking up a cigarette, became very, very hard. So they would tell me, can we call you at like three in the morning? And yeah, as much as I would love to be there and serve my clients, I also value my sleep. And at the time I also had babies, small kids, and I really didn't want people calling me at three o'clock at night. So can we help these people at even these times? when we are not able to traditionally be in our offices. So there's lots of unknowns that impact and influence our interventions and their outcomes. And we'll see how technology can be helpful as I proceed. So the next key feature is process-based. CPS focuses a focus is on processes of behavior change that allow for psychological events to be predicted and influenced towards reaching desired analytic, prosocial, and practical goals. Process of change can refer to concepts with different levels of precision, scope, and depth that might include basic behavioral processes such as reinforcement, extinction, derived relational responding, and so on, evolutionary multi-level and multi-dimensional contextual processes. Here we may look at genetics, epigenetic factors, evolution, or cultural practices. And therapeutic processes of change expressed usually in middle-level terms, orienting analysis towards domains of importance, such as acceptance, uh, compassion, values, and so on. So CPS research needs basic and applied research to identify the processes of change. CPS research needs to identify and conceptualize intervention kernels using basic, applied, experimental, analog, and inductive research methods. Kernels are fundamental units of behavior influence or treatment elements that, if eliminated, render an intervention ineffective. To identify them, an individualized process-based functional analysis is needed. It can also be identified in component analysis, dismantling studies, basic studies, and experimental analogs. Research needs behavioral and biophysiological measures of processes of change. This calls for moving beyond traditional self-report and examining only middle level terms to processes of change having better and widely available behavioral and biophysiological measures that can account for basic behavioral and evolutionary accounts of processes of change, linking concepts to context and they have to be functional. 
So we need more high density longitudinal research. We also need to conduct randomized clinical trials in ways that foster ideographic analysis or processes of, of processes of change. CPS research needs to develop or utilize adaptive clinical research methods to rigorously test treatment components. We need to utilize and also develop innovations in trial design by isolating components of interest. Some examples here of adaptive designs include things like SMART, if you've heard of it before, sequential multiple assigned randomized trials or micro randomization designs, which I will show a little bit later um, how technology can, can do some of that. These designs have in common a scientifically pragmatic approach to isolating, titrating, and testing components for different individuals under different conditions, and thus have the potential to render information that is more clinically useful and contextually sensitive. CPS research needs more ideographic and longitudinal dynamic network-based research in conjunction with high temporal density behavioral and biophysiological measures. Um, what else did I want? Okay, we also need to integrate research findings into underlying models of applied work. Treatment models are necessary to simplify and organize individuals' needs and goals, processes of change, and intervention kernels. However, model development is an iterative process and needs continuous revision and improvement based on evidence. So we should not consider any model permanent and should strive for model revision, change, or altering based on research and data. So CBS research needs to facilitate generalization and aim for scalability as well. So let's see how digital interventions can um, examine processes of change and conducting research, uh, process-based research. In terms of um, digital interventions, I have here some examples from work from my research lab where we uh, develop um, acceptance and commitment therapy based interventions that are digital, fully digital. You see here some of the avatars we use. Some of them, like the second one here called Accept Me, is gamified. Um, or you have these characters or code travelers helping individuals move along the intervention. These interventions can be with the person anytime they need them, anywhere. So at any point when they want to connect, they can connect through these digital interventions. Um, they can do it at their own time. They don't have to show up in our offices and they can repeat parts if they want to repeat different uh, components or processes during the time uh, in between um, the sessions. In terms of multi-level assessment and this link between um, self-reports but also bio uh, physiological measures, here I show you um, some of our recent work on this. We're very excited about this work. This has been work that it's been going on for about five years now that we're trying this out, where we are looking at um, digital technologies like bracelets, and some of you may wear things like Fitbits and things like that, that capture psychophysiological equipment uh, measures along with a lot of other information about um, the person. So some spatial temporal type of uh, measures, like how much time is spent sitting down, how far people travel and so on. Um, and we can really, with this type of technology, once we are able to perfect it, that is because we've run into so many problems, hopefully it will give us an indication that will be 
um, that will collect data that will be multi-level and also multi-model. Also in my laboratory, we're using virtual reality and particularly I'm very excited about this multi-user virtual reality project where therapists and uh, patients or participants are to never meet um, in person. All is done digitally and remotely. So the patient goes into this virtual world, they create in, in this, um, uh, this first one we're testing out, they're creating their own avatar or figure. So you see here, the person created this figure to look like them. And they meet the therapist only inside this virtual environment. You wanna see the therapist? You'll be surprised that the therapist is this box. So with a lot of testing that we did with our patients or individuals we wanted to apply this intervention to, um, we showed them all sorts of different avatars to represent the therapist. And interestingly, they chose the therapist to be represented by this box looking thing. Um, they found this to be non-threatening. Um, they like that it doesn't really look like a person, so it wouldn't judge them. So this is a trial, of course, of, for people with eating disorders. So, I mean, other populations may not prefer a box like this, but these patients or these participants did. In terms of network-based research and testing theoretical models, and especially our ACT uh, model or psychological flexibility model, uh, in one of uh, in uh, one of our uh, doctoral dissertations that we did uh, with one of our students, we worked on using network analysis models to see if we could um, examine the basis for our psychological flexibility or ACT hexaflex model to see whether these middle level terms um, link together in the way we imagine them to link or hypothesize them to link in our model. Interestingly, this didn't pin out exactly as we expected. And we're in the process now of, uh, of uh, writing up our final analysis following three different studies that we did to test this out. We tested it with using single measurements or using one measure to capture all processes. And hopefully we'll soon be able to tell you more about this or maybe even revise our hexaflex model. Moving on to the third, um, feature of um, uh, and recommendations proposed by the task force is the multidimensional feature. And we know that human functioning is multidimensional. Uh, building from Hayes' uh, work from 2019, um, existing research in processes of change are theorized to link to an extended evolutionary approach by considering variation, selection, retention, and contextual feed in a loose set of six psychological dimensions, affect, cognition, self, attention, motivation, and overt behavior, and are considered in terms of their adaptive or maladaptive functions. Additional dimensions may include dyadic, social and cultural levels, and biophysiological levels. So we wanna track changes in a multidimensional way using functional analytic concepts with precision and good feed to the underlying analytical purposes. So for example, psychological flexibility is hypothesized to be a multidimensional concept and should be as studied as such. CPS needs to continue to refine both the precision of concepts use and the link between concepts and their practical or theoretical analytic purpose. We want to assess the extent to which each in identified dimension can be functionally measured 
using multiple methods and in a way that fosters successful functional analysis. So in a CPS approach, concepts are functional and contextually embedded. Thus, various assessment and analytical methods are needed to examine the conceptual and clinical utility of key concepts. Advances are needed for ideographic assessment along different dimensions of psychological activity. We also want to assess uh, the extent to which intervention outcomes are due to various change dimensions at the ideographic level. Advances are needed to link identified processes to interventions and to do so at the level of the individual. So finding ways to move beyond traditional mediational analyses, um, which however have yet to be able to, to be identified at the individual level. So finding what mediates then outcomes for each individual person we may see. And then assess extent to which different dimensions link to and influence each other. And of course, a transdisciplinary approach is needed. So we need to be collaborating with neuroscientists, epigeneticists, sociologists, <clears throat> computer scientists, medical doctors, and so on. <clears throat> In terms of technology now, here is again one project. Um, this is a project that we're collaborating on with Andrew Gloster in Switzerland. Um, and this is a just right intervention. So via a cell phone app, uh, participants will be able to engage. They can be assessed at multiple times during a day using uh, technologies like um, methodologies like ecological momentary assessment methodologies. So we'll be getting repeated measures, um, longitudinal then data for each individual person. And based on their um, responses, this uh, just right intervention, what we call the virtual coach, we'll be doing micro randomizations, which I mentioned earlier as one new area that can be utilized within contextual behavior science. So based on participant re responses, they will be getting different feedback um, that's gonna be micro randomized based on, on the response. And that way we can then study, depending on how the person, what the person needs at this moment, what we provide for them, how helpful is that? So depending on the feedback we give them, we may get different results when I give them, for example, a values response or when I give them an acceptance response. So this is a, a new methodology we're trying out right now. We don't have, um, we ha are in the process of collecting data. We don't have the outcomes yet, but I hope uh, in the near future, we'll be able to tell you how this worked. I'm, I'm very excited. You can probably tell how excited I am about um, this work. In terms of um, collaborating with other uh, practitioners or other disciplines, a lot of our work uh, links psychologists with behavioral health, with cognitive science, with computer science and medicine to be able to um, come up with a lot of these digital uh, assessments and interventions to be able to provide them to each individual person and study geographically what may be happening. The fourth key feature is the is pro-social. Um, and here we believe that we need explicit pro-social, we, we have an explicit pro-social purpose and we need to foster social justice. CPS research needs to be, um, to seek scientific knowledge that fosters pro-social behavior and social justice, understanding social influences on psychological actions and promoting ways towards equity and equality, thriving, health and well-being, social justice and fairness. 
We want to address diversity and individual differences in assessment, treatment, and process of change research. We want to acknowledge our bias and aim to decrease it by utilizing practices such as actively working in groups from diverse backgrounds, co-developing interventions um, with end users and key stakeholders to be able to minimize our bias uh, in our hypotheses. To solve the most urgent human problems globally, it requires cooperation. So as it happened in the present pandemic, um, behavioral aspects of, um, aspects of our behavior became very prominent, like needing to uh, get people to use their masks or uh, wash their hands or keep distances, for example. So we see that it, medicine alone could not solve this problem and psychological factors were important in, in this endeavor. So CPS needs to contribute evidence-based approaches to creating environments that help balance cooperation and competition. Most psychological research focuses on individuals, yet it is important to study also social networks through which we can promote prosocial behaviors. We also need to build a more vigorous applied wing of evolutionary science itself. And we need to support evolutionary and cultural scientists in conducting intervention research true to their assumptions and move uh, beyond mere observation and description. So in terms of utilizing technology, um, technology by itself immediately decreases some of our bias because we're not there. Uh, it, it's, it's a little bit um, uh, tailored uh, and, and, and um, to each individual, yet um, we don't, uh, it cuts down on our bias as therapists. And by using um, digital technologies, we mentioned the phone earlier and all of us being connected, connected to other people, connected to social media, we can use um, such social network analysis to be able to um, study various phenomena of interest. Um, we got a, a grant, it was interestingly, we got a grant right before the pandemic hit about tackling anti-vaccination and mapping the social transmission of beliefs and attitudes of individuals um, using social network analysis. This work became even more important with, um, with the current pandemic and a big anti-vaccination movement that's uh, creating problems for us to be able to come out of this uh, pandemic. So uh, we're trying to quickly work through this uh, study to be able to come with outcomes as well as with new recommendations um, and, and ways of tackling anti-vaccination. And the last um, key feature is the pragmatic um, uh, feature. So a defining characteristic of CBS is its pragmatic focus. CBS involves a articulated relationship between basic science and practical applications, where the best science allows for simultaneous understanding, prediction, and influence of change in the real world and vice versa, the best applied programs link to and aid in a fuller understanding and specification of basic principles. So scientific progress can thus be measured by its breadth and depth of its pragmatic outcomes. So within CBS, we need to develop practical research and intervention tools. We need what uh, Steve Hayes and, and Stefan Hoffman called idiomographic approach, where, uh, which consciously links intensive ideographic analysis of individuals to nomothetic generalizations that do not distort, however, findings at the individual level. We also need cross-cultural, a cross-cultural focus and attention to biases that influence research and explications. 
we need to develop practical solutions for such cross-cultural differences and integration of social and cultural issues into research. We need to overcome these English language barriers to publishing and being included, for example, having non-English um, language uh, uh, studies be included in meta-analyses or reviews and so on. Researchers need to be aware of their own biases and worldviews and aim to understand the socio-political and cultural context of the behavior being studied. They also need to address community issues and conducting research. We want to maximize external validity by including key stakeholders in research. Need for strengthening the practical impact of research and research strategy. We want to include par par practitioners um, and participants to have a voice into the research questions that we're asking and into our outcomes. Um, if you ask usually patients, they won't tell you that they care for what we said earlier, 500 gram change in weight or one point change in their um, you know, depression score. They may care about their quality of life, being functional in their lives and so on. Um, including things like stakeholder steering groups um, is a possible example of being able to, to achieve this. Dissemination is also needed that is practical and we can bear to learn from implementation science frameworks on um, how to examine contextual adaptations in diverse real world settings. CPS also needs to focus on training of our researchers and our practitioners. Practical and effective methods of creating quality CBS researchers and practitioners should be a continuing focus within our association and our groups. We want to find ways to ensure that research meeting human needs is promulgated and used. It's not enough to do research. Its value requires promulgation and utilization. We need to find ways to best disseminate our CBS tools in ways that they can actually improve people's lives. And here comes technology again to help us with a lot of this. So here I present some of our, our recent work again. Uh, this is work where we use machine learning to help us um, make sense of a lot of real data that we get and longitudinal um, ideographic type data to be able to come with ways of classifying and also predicting different aspects uh, of behavior like approach acceptance or avoidance um, to be able to in the future utilize uh, such knowledge in real time uh, especially using technologies like the bracelets I talked about earlier so that we can actually uh, be engaging with our um, participants, with our patients in real time and provide um, um, ideographically based uh, uh, feedback. Um, here's another example. Um, I put this to illustrate um, a new tool we're developing um, that where we included our stakeholders into the development of this. This is co-developed. It's, it's a breast cancer based project. Um, uh, the specific project is for testing and evaluating the collection of patient reported outcomes in cancer care using innovative approaches. So this digital health tool is co-created with the stakeholders. We are collaborating with uh, breast cancer centers, with oncology centers, and with um, organizations, non-governmental non, uh, organizations serving these individuals um, so as to be able to set up an application that, and, and a collection of tools that will specifically address the needs of this uh, population and all this has an ac acceptance and commitment fla uh, therapy flavor uh, to it so utilizing our uh, principles in this um, uh, 
project. Again, this is a project that's uh, happening now. Uh, we just uh, um, finished its development and we're getting ready to start testing it now in, in real uh, life. So hopefully we'll be able to tell you more um, coming up soon. So finally, recommendation 33 is to foster these task force recommendations across laboratories, classrooms, scientific reports, and applied agencies to foster these recommendations across ACBS, conferences, uh, publications that we come up with, committees we, we serve on. And this is what I'm doing here, trying to um, foster these by giving you ways, um, first presenting them and then giving you ways of possible um, means to address some of these recommendations and to take our science into the next century, I would say, but next few years uh, to come. So I hope I didn't bore you too much. Um, and I thank you again. And here you can see some of the the pictures from laboratory activities when we used to be able to meet in person. I should have put a digital picture here as well. So thank you very much. And uh, Bartos, I think we can take questions. Do we have time for a few questions? Right, uh, we do. And if you want to write any questions in chat, please uh, do, or I can uh, give you the mic. But uh, thus far, there's a question. Uh, Guided by this white paper, uh, what would you recommend for researchers from um, low and middle income countries who do not have a lot of research funds? Which of those focus points and recommendations are immediately available uh, for low fund researchers? Very good question. And I'm very glad that somebody asked this. Um, this is exactly what we wanted uh, what we want within ACPS to help foster research in low middle income countries as well. So um, you will, you may have heard or you will hear soon about different initiatives within ACPS. Um, initiatives such as partnering up uh, individuals from low income countries with individuals uh, who may have more means to develop such things. Um, we also hope that researchers who are able to develop such digital interventions or digital means of examining um, or providing services will make those available freely to um, uh, even low and middle income countries to be able to uh, utilize them. Uh, and then what's needed from colleagues in those countries is to seek them out and, and disseminate them so that we can be able to, to utilize them. Any ideas also you may have? I mean, if you are from a low middle income country, um, we would love to hear uh, uh, your thoughts on this. And we would love to hear what, how, how we can better put our recommendations into action. Um, you will hear about the recommendations again if you participate in our ACBS conference, the World, World Congress in July. And we uh, will have a panel discussion specifically because we want to hear um, thoughts and ideas about how to put this um, out there. Uh, this group um, that was comprised, that comprised the task force, um, put uh, came up with these, but they're not limited. I mean, there may be other recommendations that you may suggest for us to consider. Um, and we definitely want to make this more interactive and to, to put it into practice. And here's where we need every one of you uh, to help us do that. Thank you very much, Maria. Another question. What do you think, what is the place of qualitative research in ACBS and within the current psychological science in general? 
um, again, a great question. Thank you for um, uh, bringing this up. Uh, qualitative uh, research definitely has a role to play. One of the good things with qualitative research is that it tends to be geographic and it gives us a lot of information, in-depth information about individuals. So uh, I would take that many times as a, as a first uh, step in doing a lot of um, the things that will take us then into uh, quantitative type research or other um, methods of, of research. So qualitative research has a big role to play. Um, we recently had a conference uh, here in Cyprus. It was a digital conference, again, on qualitative um, approaches to science, uh, linking social science with health behavior uh, science. And actually, Steve uh, Hayes had presented in that conference, and he was uh, talking about this issue specifically. So if you want to connect, and I'll give you more information about that as well. Uh, but definitely qualitative research is important and can be a first stepping stone into doing a lot of the things that uh, we recommended here. And the last question thus far, um, basing on the uh, research on the ACT model uh, that you mentioned during the lecture, what would be your early ideas for revising the Hexaflex model? Um, <laughs> thank you for the question. Difficult one to answer. Um, in reality, what I'm, I, I'm not proposing, we're not going to propose a change in the model yet. I think what we're going to come back and propose is that um, we need better, um, better definitions of our constructs and we need better ways of measuring our constructs and not just self-report ones, but considering other types of measurements um, that are multi-level, multi-dimensional, like I mentioned here. So I think as a first step, we're going to propose um, this um, clarification in our constructs and improving our measuring of them before we can then conclude anything about the model. So we're not throwing the model out. I'm, I'm not proposing that yet, but we do need to consider it and, and think about it um, and, and especially clarify our measures. Thank you very much, Maria, for your lecture.